So, you want to use science to improve your life? What kind of data should you collect and how do you identify what kind of study you're doing? Stay tuned. Howdy folks, here at Sci vs. Sci, we talk about all kinds of things related to the science of psychology. So if you're into that kind of thing, consider subscribing. It's what all of the best psychologists do. Data collection and analysis is an important part of psychology, and it's important for psychology aficionados to be statistically literate. Today, we're talking about how to identify what kind of study you're looking at, or if you're designing your own experiment, what kind of study should you be designing? Now, just an FYI, if you need more details on some of the terms here, like independent and dependent variable, correlations, experimental design, we have videos on that that I'll link to in the description uh, that go way more in depth on what each of these things are. But for now, I wanna point you to the kinds of things that determine what kind of study you're doing and then provide some examples. Now, it's summer here in Texas and it's perfect weather for wasps to be out and about. And yesterday, I found a huge wasp nest outside. Of course, I carefully observed them from a distance for a while and waited until dusk to lower them gently into a cardboard box and carefully relocate them to a new home in the wilderness. Now that got me thinking about how some people are scared of wasps <laughs> and want to poison them. Psychology is the science of behavior, and attitudes towards wasps and the resulting behavior raises many psychological questions. So let's say I'm hired as a consultant for a leading brand of pesticide, and they're interested in understanding the factors that make people buy wasp spray. That might lead me to collect data in a, a few different ways. But first let me go through things to consider when determining the type of study, and then I can give examples of some of the approaches I might take. That's right, I'm using this as one more chance to spend a whole video talking about bugs, not to bother anyone in particular. So the first thing to ask is whether your data is from an experimental design or a correlational design. Are you manipulating conditions, like in an experiment, or are you simply measuring two variables to see if they're related to each other? Now, if you've seen our video on correlations versus experimental designs, you'll remember that the big difference between them is that correlations allow you to determine a relationship exists between variables, but you cannot determine which variable causes which. Do people who buy more wasp spray have higher fear of wasps? Or do people who have higher fear of wasps buy more spray? Or maybe people with more exposure to wasps are both more afraid and buy more spray. So with a correlation, we can't be sure the direction of the causal arrow, and we won't be able to determine how to cause people to buy more spray. So that's a huge limitation. One simple way to make this determination is to ask whether I am controlling which conditions people are in or not. For example, if I'm measuring how many wasps people have and comparing that to how much spray they buy, the participant is controlling both of those measurements not me. Or if I simply ask, do you have wasps around your home? I'm not assigning them to the groups wasps and no wasps, so that's not an experimental design. On the other hand, if I randomly select some participants and I go to their houses and remove wasp nests and go to other participants' houses and install those extra wasp nests that I happen to have lying around, well, I'm manipulating something, aren't I? Now that's a good experimental design. True experimental designs require both a dependent and independent variable. If you've seen my video on dependent and independent variables, you'll know that I like to use the following format to describe experiments. The effect of blank on blank. <laughs> the first blank is the independent variable, the thing that you manipulate. And the second blank is the dependent variable, which you measure. So the effect of wasp exposure on wasp spray purchases suggests that I'm manipulating the number of wasps someone is exposed to, and then I measure how much wasp spray they buy. One thing you have to watch out for is when it looks like an experiment because you are comparing data between two groups, but the participants aren't randomly assigned to those groups. For example, I could compare the groups psych majors and non-psych majors but I don't have control over whether someone is a psych major or not. I can't take 20 people and flip a coin and say, okay, you. Yeah, you, you're a psych major now. <laughs> I 
Instead, people decide for whatever reasons, based upon their personal experiences, to become psych majors or not. So it looks like two groups, but these were groups people were in before they came to my experiment. Now we call these intact groups, and they could be influenced by factors outside of our experiment. That means we can't be sure if any differences we observe in the experiment are due to differences in the groups or differences in some third variable that also happens to influence who goes into which group, just like in a correlation. Now that said, you'll see intact groups all the time in studies, using things like gender or political beliefs or socioeconomic status or are often used as comparison groups, but these aren't true experiments. They're better thought of as pseudo experiments because they look like an experiment, but they use intact groups. Let's go through some examples and see if it's a correlation, an experimental design, or a pseudo experiment. All right, experiment one. I'm gonna ask people whether they have wasps around their home, yes or no, and whether they have bought wasp spray in the past month, yes or no. Right? Super simple questionnaire. Now I want to see if having wasps is related to the amount of wasp spray purchased. So what do you think? Is this a correlation, an experimental design, or a pseudo experiment? <laughs> In this case, I'm measuring existing variables and not manipulating anything. So this is not an experimental design. Now this example is a little tricky because I'm only asking yes, no questions, but I would be tempted to say this looks like a pseudo experiment because I presume that there may be a difference between groups, those who have wasps versus those who don't. Okay, experiment two. I run a couples getaway summer camp and I rent cabins to couples for two weeks during the summer. Uh, during their stay, they're able to buy wasp spray in the gift shop. Now this doesn't have anything to do with the channel or what we're talking about today. I just thought you should be aware. Let's say I divide the couples into low and high wasp exposure. I take wasp nests down from the low exposure cabins and, you know, relocate those to the high exposure cabins. I also change the price of the wasp spray in the gift shop, low cost and high cost. I find that when there is low exposure to wasps, buying spray is highly price dependent. Whereas if there are a lot of wasps, people will buy even at a high price. So what do we think? Is this a correlation, an experimental design, or a pseudo experiment? In this case, I'm manipulating wasp exposure and manipulating price, and I'm measuring spray purchases. So this is a case where I actually have two independent variables, and I might describe this experiment as the effect of wasp exposure and price on spray purchasing. So this would be an experimental design. On to experiment three. I'm gonna measure the number of wasp nests around each participant's home and count the total money spent on spray in the past month. I noticed that people who bought more spray have fewer nests. Is this a correlation, experiment, or pseudo experiment? This one would be a correlation. I'm not controlling how many wasps they have, nor how much they spend. These are two variables that I can show a relationship between, but I can't be sure which causes which. For experiment four, I'm gonna have people read an article about how wasps are helpful animals and important pest hunters, with tips on how to live harmoniously with them with no risk of stings. A control group will read a similar article, but every time that we see the word wasp, I'm going to replace it with the word goat. <laughs> a third group is going to read an article about how deadly stinging insects can be. Does the amount of fear influence spray purchases? Okay, is this a correlation experiment or pseudo experiment? It's an experiment because I'm controlling the amount of fear by manipulating the information available to the participant. Good job. Okay, for our fifth and final experiment, I had participants rate their fear of wasps on a scale so I could easily classify them into high and low fear groups. I then followed them for one month and measured spray purchasing. 
I found that the high fear group purchased more spray than the low fear group. Is this a correlation, experiment, or pseudo-experiment? This is a pseudo-experiment. It looks a lot like experiment four with a key difference. In this case, I didn't control how much fear they had. I just measured it. They came in with that fear and they took it with them when they left. I compared the two groups, but they were intact groups, not a true experiment. Okay, if you're still with us, you are awesome. I hope this has helped you see the difference between experiments, pseudo experiments, and correlations. And if so, can you do me a favor and like press that little like button down there? If you have any questions about examples that I didn't cover, leave a comment. We do read those and we do answer them. Consider subscribing for more videos on all things psychology. And until next time, keep thinking. Why, oh why did I choose a weird topic like wasps? Now I have to say wasp spray like a hundred times. Wasp spray, wasp spray, wasp spray, wasp spray, wasp spray.